Welcome, everyone. We're continuing to work through the book of James, and we're doing James chapter 4. We're just doing two verses, verses 11 and 12, but in those two verses, there's a lot for us to unpack. So let's just get into it. I'm going to read the scripture to you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? As we've been working through this book, we see that James kind of has almost like little mini sermons or mini lessons that are kind of calling us to think about how we live out our lives, how we have the gospel affect us. And actually kind of what's happening in it is it's it's forcing us to say, oh, do I actually believe this story, this story of what Jesus did for me and how it shifts and change my, changes my life? Does it radically make a difference? Do we treat other people with the grace that God treats us with? And so there's, it really is this kind of challenging scripture that says, do you know how to apply the gospel to your own life? So James says, we should not speak evil. The Greek word there is katalaleet. Okay? In, in the, if you have an NIV, it's probably translated as slander. But actually, I think the ESV, which is the translation we use, is a better translation of that word. Because slander is to speak falsely against somebody, to speak a lie against them. Whereas um, this is actually talks about speaking evil or, or using something against someone. And so you could actually um, speak something that's true, that is actually a, a thing that the person has done or that has happened to the person, and you can use it in a way that is evil. You can use it in a way that is negative, that is a way to, to push them down or to allow their past to, to influence the way that other people think about them or you think about them in order to think less of them. We've actually seen this recently in our culture. Um, the story of George Floyd, the, the man who was grabbed and thrown to the ground, handcuffed, and had a police officer sit on his neck for almost eight minutes until he suffocated and died. And what we see coming back is the backlash is, well, George Floyd had a previous record of all of these wrongs that he did. And those are absolutely true. He did those things. He was charged. He was judged in them um, through the system. And so those aren't necessarily being denied. But what happens is they're somehow trying to diminish the evil that this man who had actually done nothing wrong at the moment was killed over right? He, he had been accused of trying to pay for something with a counterfeit bill, and the bill was authentic, and that's why he was being arrested. And so they're, they're using his past in order to try to say, oh, it's all right because he has a bad past. See, that's exactly what James is saying. He's saying you, you use something, even though it's true, in order to belittle, in order to make somebody else smaller. You see, when we look down on another person. We're suggesting that we have a moral superiority over them. Do you ever wonder why gossip is so tantalizing? Why it's something that we're just so quickly drawn to? And even though we don't want to do it, we just find ourselves falling into it. Because when we hear about somebody else's shortcomings or failures or mistakes, it makes us feel better about ourselves. Oh, at least I'm not that bad because I didn't do this thing, right? It's, it's tantalizing. It, it makes us feel as though we have a moral edge over somebody else. I remember when I was in middle school, I had two kind of best friends and we spent the weekends together almost all the time. And there was this moment where I was with just one of them and he began to tell me all the things he didn't like about the other guy. And then another few days later, I was with the other guy and he started telling me all the things he didn't like about the other friend. And then it didn't take me but a couple of minutes to realize that when the two of them are together, they're saying something terrible about me. 
And it's just this, I just realized that this is not a healthy way to be friends, to be constantly pushing each other down. Now, I, I do want to take a moment to clarify something. People will often take this verse, um, or the verse that it comes from, from Jesus, judge not lest ye be judged. And they'll use it to say, see, um, you are not allowed to make a moral judgment on anything in my life. And, or you might hear it this way, oh, the church is just full of judgmental and critical people. I'm not saying that that isn't to some degree true, maybe it is. But what they're saying is, you can't look at my life and tell, tell me that is not okay because that is making a judgment. But that's actually not what these texts are saying. I mean, if you've read any of the book of James or you've listened to a single one of the sermons, you'll realize that James is making moral judgments. He is saying, um, you need to do this and not do that. You need to live according to this because of the gospel. And Jesus, he was also in the Sermon on the Mount. He is telling you how you're supposed to live and live differently than everybody else. They are moral judgments. I think like what's interesting about that argument that you can't make any moral judgments or you can't think that your religion is right and all other religions is wrong is that those things in and of themselves are a moral judgment, right? You can't judge morality, therefore you're wrong, but I'm judging you because of that, right? Or um, because you don't accept all other religions, I have to re reject you, which is actually rejecting our religion, right? It's a part of our religion to believe that there's only the way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. So instead, J James is saying to us, he's saying that what you do with the truth, what you do with that truth determines whether you are living as a Christian or not. I have this quote from Timothy Keller. Can we have absolute commitment to truth and an absolute absence of moral superiority and a judging spirit, right? Yeah, we need to be a people who believe in truth, who believe that our lives need to be changed and transformed and that we need to pursue living holy lives. But can we do that without putting judgment or trying to be morally superior to other people? Just kind of accepting them and seeing that truth in our lives is so important. That's what James is doing. He's saying, preach to yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself. Weep when you're not doing what's right, when you're not honoring God and loving him and fearing him, right? But do that for you and with everybody else. Show love and grace. And as you speak the truth to them, do it in a way that you hope redeems as, a, as opposed to judges. Then James makes this um, incredible statement. He says that when you do these things, you are doing evil and judging the law. Well, um, what does that mean? And so uh, what is happening is he's actually taking a portion of scripture from Leviticus 19.18, where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And you will remember that um, Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He went and he, he took um, Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 1918 and he put them together right love the lord your god with all your heart soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself he said if you could do those two things you could fully live out the law so therefore um if we're looking at our brethren we see something that is taking them out of that right relationship with god then in love and in humility we go to them in order to correct them in order to bring them back into a right relationship with God, not to beat them down with how we're better and they're worse. I'm going to read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gives his thought about judgment and is what James is using. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye that when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. 
See, when we do go to speak truth to our brothers, we do it first by really humbling ourselves, checking our motives, saying, God, is there anything in me that I'm going into this with that I'm going to use to, to judge or to think myself better? And when we really humble ourselves and realize that even our ability to go and talk to somebody else is only because God has forgiven us of all of our wickedness first, then we can go and see clearly. And maybe even the thing won't seem as big. And we can try to love them out of this place of like, I know what it's like to need grace. I know what it's like to need love in the midst of my mistakes and my brokenness. Pastoring in Langley, I had the opportunity to go and lead a Bible study at the Gateway of Hope Shelter. And as I started to go week after week, I started to realize a couple of things. One was um, these people were incredibly biblically literate, like they knew the Bible. They understood it. They even know, knew many of the things to apply to their lives, which was um, a little offsetting because it was completely changing much of my stereotypes. The other thing, as I met with people and heard story after story after story, is I realized that all of their stories had something to do with horrific abuse in their past. So I went to the chaplain and I said to the chaplain, um, have you met anybody here who wasn't abused as a child? And she said, no, I haven't. And then I thought to myself, you know, if I had grown up in their shoes, if I had grown up living their life, the way that they were treated and the things that were done to them, would I have changed, would I have been any different and I realized probably not. That I am a man who's lived with incredible privilege and therefore I should be grateful and realize that I am not above anybody else because I would equally be susceptible to everything that they are because of my own human frailty. And not only that, we believe, we believe the gospel is transformative and therefore we look at everybody believing that god can do a great work in their lives i heard this incredible story um, when i was working with the family for the for the funeral of major eileen peep and uh, her son doug told me that his grandfather was kind of known as the town drunk met jesus through the salvation army got saved, um, met his wife, got married, and was um, and had a family. He had five children. All five of his children um, became ministers in the Salvation Army, um, missionaries, leaders, great preachers, and um, even one of them went up to the second highest level you can be in the Salvation Army, right? He met Jesus. His life was transformed. There is no condemnation in Christ. What a legacy. What a legacy of grace. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. So quickly, how do we know if we have a judgmental spirit? So I think the simplest one is, do I delight in hearing about somebody else's shortcomings? Do I find myself at the center of gospel, gossip? Do I think that I'm better than other people? Do people often tell me or act as though they feel beaten up by me after I've had a conversation with them? And, or do I bring up the past in order to try to control, belittle, or push other people away? Do I bring up the past in order to win an argument that has nothing to do with the past? So James says, there is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. Actually, that word destroy is really, um, it's kind of nuanced because it, it's really about the creator being able to look at something and realize that it's not what it's supposed to be. It's not actually living out its potential as the creation. And therefore, he alone, as the one who was created, has the right to go and to destroy it in order to start over. So if um, I like to do woodworking, so if I'm 
I'm working on a table and as I'm working on it, I see, oh, you know, this doesn't look the way it's supposed to look, the way that I imagine it to look. Other people might think, oh, it looks beautiful, it looks great. But I might be like, no, 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 it's just not right. Then I, as the creator, can go back and say, you're not what you're supposed to be and I can destroy it. I can redo it. I can make something different, right? That's what it's talking about. So when we reject God, when we live in sin, he is the one who can come and judge us according to the law that he gave us because he is the one who created us and knows that we're supposed to be in this right, humble relationship with him, seeking after salvation. But it also says that he is the one who can save. Jesus Christ entered into this world, the only one who had the right to judge all of us. And instead, he went and he took on all of our mistakes, all of our sins, all of our failures. He went and died on the cross for us because of those things. And as he was on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And so as he forgave the people who were killing him, at the same time, he is also forgiving us of our sins. He doesn't judge us. He doesn't condemn us. Instead, he wants that we would be saved. And if that's true of the one who has the authority to be the lawgiver, then who are we to judge our neighbors? Let's pray. God, again, we pray that you would search our hearts. We pray that you would reveal to us anything that stops us from fully living out the gospel. Preach the gospel to our souls, God. And if we have slander, if we put people down, if we try to think of ourselves as smarter and better and with more authority than other people, God, please reveal it to us. Help us to confess it and to repent and to come back with an attitude of love and a desire to see people know and encounter you. In your name we pray.